Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Fantastic. Well, actually not. I don't, I don't get energy here. Come on. How's everyone doing? Great. So before we start, I think I just want to take a minute to think about why we're here. We're celebrating change makers. We're celebrating the people who are bold enough to challenge the status quo. We're celebrating people who have the audacity to wake up and think that they're going to change the world. We're celebrating people who have the humility to dedicate their time and their resources to a cause greater than themselves. So on that note, please help me in giving another round of applause to the entrepreneurs, the founders, the people who are literally changing the world. So three words I want you to remember. One is incentives. Two, ecosystem or coexistence, we'll use them interchangeably. And three is three, just another three, because I like it. <laughs> And hopefully over the course of the session, you'll, you'll understand what I mean. So we're talking about the role of innovation in sustainability and building circular economies in Africa. That is, it's, it's a mouthful. It can mean different things to different people. So what we're going to do as we open up is I'm going to ask my fellow uh, panelists here to do three things. One is to introduce yourselves. Two is to just very quickly explain what this topic means to you, because I think it does mean something different to everyone. And number three, what is the one thing you want people to leave with today? So I'm going to invite the first panelist, Herman. Thanks, Rajiv. Um, so my name is Herman Hart, and um, I've got the pleasure to lead the Czech South Sahara Africa business. Um, we part of the Gravels Group. Uh, this is an Australian stock exchange, and it's a, a big global, uh, global corporation. So you asked me what to do. I've got a, a sexy answer, an unsexy answer, and then why are we really passionate about it? So first, so first of all, the sexy answer is we like to think we bring life essentials to most people or to more people around the globe in more countries than any other organization in the world. So life essentials, anything from your coffee this morning, you had your toothpaste, um, you know, the soap you use, um, the breakfast cereal you use, all those products will touch by probably our products. And this is the unsexy part. It's sort of just the hubble of pallets or crates, plastic crates, containers. Okay, so um, that's the products that we um, provide industry to get life essentials to people. So why we're passionate about it um, is um, we, we bless with a truly circular uh, model. We don't sell anything. We own these pieces of equipment. We own about 350 million um, assets around the globe, um, and, and we share it with, with industry. So it's a share and reuse model. So everybody shares in the same, in the same product. Okay. So the one thing that, that of our organization that I really love is there's so much, so much competition in the world. You know, you look at just South African retailers, um, the bigger places, spas, shop, checkers, et cetera, the uni leaders, the, the PNGs, they all compete with one another. We interact with all those organizations on a non-competitive basis. Um, they all use assets, and, and the assets move from the manufacturer all the way to the retailers. Okay? And, and in that role, we, we get to collaborate with, with, with all of them. And from there, I just realized the power of collaboration, and if you collaborate amongst one another, how, how much is possible. So collaboration to me is key. And what is the one thing you want people to leave with? Collaboration. Okay, fantastic. So, Bolo Watefe? Thank you, Bolo. Alright, my name is Bolo. Bolo Watefe, but for short, Bolo, right? I'm from Lagos, Nigeria. Um, I'm the co founder um, of Scrappies. Um, I'd like to start with this. Um, the solution that um, African innovators are creating um, are super important because they are not just vitamins but they are painkillers. And if I'm going to start with that, I, I see that that is what we do at Scrappies. Because um, in simple terms, I say we're creating the operating system for the recycling value chain. 
Because to be frank with you, and I wouldn't paint it in any beautiful colors, the recycled value chain is extremely broken. Right? And there must be systems to make sure that recycling is not just a cliche that just needs, you know, some sort of maybe um, grant financing and just support. Let's just do it because we want to do it. But really, if we were to solve this very deep and critical structural problems, they must be positioned as economic growth drivers. And that's the foundation of what we do as Scrapies. We have built both offline and online technologies that allows independent individuals, wherever they are, even without knowing anything about recycling before now, to start up their own mini recycling business in their own place. Just to give you context, you can say Airbnb for recyclables, right? Which means that today you can wake up and own your own mini recycling business within your own locality, serving the people within your zone. Right. So today, if somebody has, you know, um, a bunch of carton, a bunch of plastic, metal, you know, what have you, you can get paid for it through that particular individual within your zone. And we, we, we know the problem that Africa faces, and that's why we build products that are typical to the problem we face. So today we have a U.S. Census solution, which is totally offline, because we understand the people we are serving within the African ecosystem. Right? We have a WhatsApp bot as of today because we understand that literally, even when people don't have you know, um, data, they can still you know, go on WhatsApp. Right? And these so solutions like this, number one, does not just solve you know, the circular recycling of waste problem, but rather it also empower independent individuals. Just, just think of what uh, mobile money has done to financial service within the African ecosystem. We have positioned scrappers to also do the same thing for the recycling and circular economic system, right? And one thing I would like you to remember um, when we leave there is that um, the African innovators, which is what I started with, we must position everything that we are doing to be painkillers and it's solving critical problems for the next move of Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Bolo. Kidus? Hello, um, everyone. As you, as you go into it, I'm going to touch a bit more on your business model through the conversation. So, you know, just a very high level uh, and, and the other areas. What does the, the topic mean to you and what do you want people to lead with? Great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kidus Asfal. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Cubic. Uh, we make low-carbon, low-cost building materials from plastic waste. Uh, to your question around what it means uh, when I think about a circular economy or sustainability, it's when a product actually has an extension of the value for a human life. So what do I mean by that? I mean, this water bottle here, I'm drinking with it today, but if I'm able to sell it, like what your uh, uh, company is doing, Bolu, or if I'm able to have an affordable house because of it, it's actually served its purpose. And I think this is a very powerful piece. So we'll definitely talk a bit more about what Cubic does later. Um, what I would like you to take away is a very common theme around African innovation. Um, I've worked uh, in the development space for quite some time, and it always frustrated me of how the African continent was always seen as a beneficiary. I'd like to believe that it's a launching pad to solutions for the world. Uh, what we've done at Cubic is started in Africa, it's going to expand in Africa, but we see it as exporting a very critical uh, critical solution for the world from Africa as well. Thank you very much. And last but certainly not least, Clariska. Here, we want to identify, so seek out um, tech skills, 
in our mainstream research, scientific research and development space, but innovations that have been developed by communities in response to the many challenges that they face. So my role is as head of experimentation at the UNDP. So it's all about once these solutions are identified, how do we pilot them? How do we test them in a real environment to produce evidence of their potential success? Because let's face it, evidence-based decision making is now mainstream. Um, so we're trying to produce produce the data, sorry, that can actually showcase um, the workability of these solutions. Now, as we go into the discussions around sustainability, we, our focus of late has been around how do we get small businesses to consider doing good while doing business? How do you mainstream the ideas around societal and environmental awareness, this consciousness about um, doing well for the environment, promoting Agenda 2030, the SDGs? Um, and, and in doing this, it is possible. And throughout the discussion here today, I'm excited to showcase how we've been working with some private sector partners or themselves working towards advancing the SDGs while generating a profit. There's various cases that we can share from large corporates to small businesses. If I take, for example, Unilever. Unilever has been seeing extensive growth in sustainable brands of late. And these brands have been driving 75% of Unilever's growth over the last while. They've been seeing 69% increases in sales in sustainable products. And what are these products? These are products that we use, Dove, Canor, Lipton Tea. And why has it been gaining such traction? The reason for this is because they are pushing these products as social and environmental goods. Lipton Tea, as an example, uh, their plantations have received rainforest, a Rainforest Alliance uh, certification, which means that the Lipton Tea that you drink comes from farms that make sure um, workers are paid fairly, from farms where wastewater is being reused to not extract our natural resources even further, farms that are using solar energy and reducing the reliance on fossil fuels. So these are the kinds of products that we want to see and, and we want to showcase as businesses still doing what they should be doing, making a profit, and that's absolutely the goal of any business. But at the same time, it is possible to work on the sustainable development goals. It might not be foremost in mind when designing a new business, but absolutely can be done. And being a small scale enterprise, this is an opportunity to put in operational and business practices now towards sustainability, towards environmental regeneration, because let's face it, as you mature and become the next Unilever and the next Walmart, um, it becomes so much more onerous, so much more expensive to become sustainable later on. And let's not, um, let's not negate the importance of reputation and brand when it comes to sustainability. Gen Z, the millennials are all consumers that are environmentally and socially aware. Uh, they, they really want to be associated with brands that are doing good for the environment. So as a small business, this is an opportunity now to do something within your space, within your sector, while trying to generate a profit. So that's very much how the UNDP is viewing sustainability. Private sector, small business is really driving the message. Government, academia can only do so much. The real multinational in the room is the private sector. And as small businesses develop, if they can really mainstream these ideas, uh, then we can actually achieve and meet the goals of Agenda 2030 and the SDGs. So if so there's anything to take away, that is the message. Thanks. Great, thank you. And that's the, that's the collaboration word that we, that we heard about earlier. So we just come out of the healthcare conversation, and I love analogies, so I'm going to do my best to draw a very quick analogy using the number three, uh, and, and take us into the conversation on, on sustainability. So when you, when you think about it, there, I, I'm going to suggest that there's three types of people who go out and seek healthcare services. Uh, so, so the first type of person is someone who's got a cold, a flu, a tangible problem that they need to address in order for them to continue and live their life. 
sustainability-wise, we, we, we sort of draw a parallel there. There's a flood or a fire or, or whatnot as a result of what's going on around us. And we need to put out a short-term issue in order to continue uh, in, in, in our day-to-day. -day. The second type of person is someone who is in a healthcare context doing things for aesthetics or maybe ego. Uh, so we won't get into the details there about some of the uh, healthcare services that are available to, to service those uh, attributes. And, and similarly, I, what I call the Tesla uh, theory is, is, is the people who are driving electric vehicles, why are they doing it? Is it for the environment or other reasons? And then there's this third type of individual who understands that within your body, there are things that are happening that are intangible. You can't see it, but you know you need to be aware of it because these are the silent killers. 75% of deaths come from non-communicable diseases, the silent killers. So similarly, what's going on around us, we can't see is intangible. The difficulty is incentivizing people to fall into that third category, both healthcare-wise and from a sustainability or environment perspective. So Herman, when it comes to driving these sorts of incentives, how have you seen it, and, and if you want to take the perspective of collaboration and, and what you've seen through, through your vantage point, how do you incentivize people to focus on things that we need, but they can't see? It's not in their day-to-day, -day. it's not a short-term obstruction. Yeah, difficult question in, in, in our operations. Uh, you know, we, we specialize in getting product to, 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 to people. But I think it's just, I think from corporates, as, as any corporate really, is really just to socialize it, to communicate it, and for, for, for corporates to become more socially aware and do the right thing. So um, there's the, the ESG investors these days. It's a really big thing. I mean, there's, there's this view that, that, that investors are just in, in it for money. But there's a, a big group of investors um, uh, today that, that ask all the relevant questions. You know, what is your ESG policy? You know, environmental, social, and governance. Very important. So I think most of the major big corporations globally are, are, are looking at sort of reporting on those issues and, and putting it up, up, up there and, and to attract those investments. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big positive drive yeah. from a corporate perspective. So it's not really incentivizing the consumer, but, but, but incentivizing the corporates to attract those years to investments. Yeah. If we, if we sort of think about a spectrum, on the one end of the spectrum, what we've seen in entertainment, when we switch Netflix on, you have a movie like Don't Look Up. And, and, and we've seen the you know, Hollywood and uh, pop culture try to play their part as well in creating narratives and, and documentaries and uh, those sorts of things. So on the one hand, we're trying to put material out there that encourages people or incentivize people. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we've got a country like South Korea, and I'm going to reference a stat that I saw recently, which is in 1995, 2% of uh, food waste was recycled in Korea. Today, that's 95%. Now, what they've done is they've taken an approach on the opposite end of the spectrum, which is creating laws. They find people, they reward people for anonymous tips, and recycling, is linked to your government ID, so you can, you can go to that extreme. What I want to touch on with Bolu is finding a middle ground, because what you've managed to do really well is build that inherently into your business model where you don't have to be on either extreme, where you're waiting for people to have an aha moment or mandating it by law. Yeah. So help us understand how you've uh, figured out a, a, a business model that achieves that. Okay, so um, let, let me take it off from there. Um, it's very important for us. The first thing is um, we are positioning ourselves to change the narrative about um, what we naturally see as waste, right? And um, we are seeing that that particular flow is getting ingrained in people. In areas where we have um, active agents, and this is, um, if you know, it plays around um, in, it's in Lagos, Managria, whereby it's one of the places that we have the most concentrated number of agents. In such areas, you don't see pet bottles on the floor again. Why? Because as of today, literally everyone within that area knows that 
if I stack up be it a pet bottle, be it a capital or what have you, I just need to take it down to this person over here who would immediately because and uh, we will put the solution such that even before you take it down to that person, you have an idea of the value of what you already have with you. Right? Even using our tools, you have certain WhatsApp apps, you know that okay, that take a kilogram of milk that is what you're going to be given. Immediately you take it to that person if it's scaled, you automatically paid either fiscal cash or into your phone number. Right? What incentive has torn without any form of force is that literally everyone that knows that if I have this stack of item here, it's not just a problem to me, but rather it's another resource for me to source income. And the importance of incentive as we go along is that we build some sort of auto start system within people, <coughs> whereby we are not in a position whereby you need extreme laws, quote and unquote, to say you must do this. Because you know, it's like you're extremely forcing people. But when we build models that allow people allows people to see that okay, um, really this thing is a resource for me. And at that point, we will have shifted recycling or circular economy to something that is just an ordinary do-good vibe, right? But rather, if we are not positioning it as something that you just must do because it's something you have value from or came from. I don't know if you, you get what I'm trying to say. Yes. Perfect. Kiddos, I have three questions you in one, if that's okay. The first one is how, the second one is how, and the third one is how. So you've managed to figure out a way to turn waste, plastic waste, into really, really valuable material uh, for multiple uses. So the first question, how do you do that? How do you figure that out? And how do we get everyone else to do this? So just, just uh, answer all three of these how questions into one. Um, I'll just take you back a few years ago uh, when I was leading innovation at UNICEF. And we were trying to figure out uh, a problem that, that had nothing to do with trash. It was how do we alleviate the burden of uh, babies getting sick from malaria and diarrhea in cities? It was a really big problem. Now, the more that we started to look at this, what we noticed was there was a lot of plastic waste in the sewer system that would, have, that would either stagnate water, which becomes a great breeding ground for, for uh, mosquitoes. It was clogging up sewers, which meant there was a lot of poor sanitary conditions in slum areas. And all of these were contributing to babies dying, to put it very plainly. So we naturally came down to start to think about, well, how do we take all of this trash out? <coughs> Now, we went to a landfill, and we started to just investigate what the market for trash was, especially plastic waste. And just like Bogu said, uh, there was a heap amount of plastic bottles. And they were all going for sale. Like, it, it was running uh, like clockwork. But then I asked uh, the aggregator there who was selling this plastic, I said, well, you know, there's all of this plastic uh, underneath, how much would you sell that? And he said, what are you going to do with it? Why, why do you need it? That was the aha moment for me, because the how came down not about recycling or strengthening the supply chain, but actually creating demand around plastic waste that did not have any kind of value for people. So we were able to actually come up with a technology that could take hard to recycle waste. So this is the stuff that nobody buys, and there's a lot of it and be able to convert it into something that also has a solution for a different problem, which is affordability. The reason why poor people live in poorly constructed houses is not because they want to, it's because they can't afford anything better. And being able to provide a high quality product where they can afford to have access to, came back to trash. So when we created Cubic, what we started to think for ourselves was, not about trash, not about building materials, but about how do we actually create dignity for those that don't currently have access to choice around quality products, and how do they have dignity around 
choosing where they can live and that place being clean. Having that vision is what helped us create a business model that would allow us to work with the likes of scrap pay, create demand around trash that currently does not have value, but also supply a product that can give a broad brush of the population in a place like Ethiopia, Nigeria, or Cote d'Ivoire access to high quality building materials. And that made uh, what we do truly circular, not only around this bottle being used as a bottle again, but having a different purpose for human life. Super fascinating. I mean, I could talk trash for hours, but <laughs> me too. You know, I mean, we'll, 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 we'll come back to that. But also, you heard it here first. We've got a East African, West African potential partnership that is formed in South Africa. Uh, with this so, uh, <laughs> that's a collaboration that we're talking about, right? So, Priska, you are head of experimentation at the UNDP. Now, I'm going to challenge you slightly, maybe put you on the spot, be a bit provocative here, because I, I had a quick look at the 2022 progress report for the SDGs. 2030 is the timeline we've given ourselves. Rather than not being on track, it looks like, but of course we've had COVID and we've had, as a, as a global society, we've had major setbacks over the last few years, but it looks like we're going in the, in the wrong direction. So when you experiment, part of that process is agility, recalibrate what's working, what's not, let's reassess and adjust accordingly. Surely by this point we should be taking that approach when it comes to the SDGs and if so, how are you seeing that manifest through your vantage point at the UNDP? Yeah, thanks, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, the, the theme is within well, thinking within the UN slash the UNDP is that Agenda 2030 and the current trajectory will not be met. So in 2019, the Accelerator Program was born, and that is saying, what we're doing currently won't get us to our goals and the indicators we are trying to get to. Um, so the accelerator program itself is the UN's attempt at finding alternative solutions that can help us advance the progress we need to make. So what we're trying to do is to rapidly, in a very short time frames and time bursts, find solutions, test these solutions, and then partner with the private sector to actually scale these solutions. So what experimentation is truly about is trying to pinpoint case studies, models that have proven to work, and how do we make them relevant in the African or South African context. So the accelerator program here is what, the one based in South Africa, but there's 30 others along the African continent, and as well as other developing nations. So what we're trying to say is, let's find alternative solutions that can advance this progress. But while we're doing this, we're keeping at the back of our mind success stories within private sector. And I mentioned earlier, private sector is seen as the draw card, is seen as the players that need to come to the table to help us advance our progress. So one example, you know, how do we create this? We spoke about incentives earlier. How do we create this awareness, this kind of education among private business that doing good while doing business is possible. And some of the exciting case studies we've come across from corporates, if I take the example of Walmart, for example, 15, nearly 15 years ago, they started thinking about sustainability. And when we talk about sustainability, it comes from this place of being very purpose-driven. It's not easy. It's a very difficult path to work sustainability into a growing business. And, and, and being a purpose-driven individual, and this comes from a deep sense, a personal space of why you start something. You were mentioning now about your start and, and looking at the plastic that's just lying there. It comes from a very personal sense, a deep purpose of why someone gets into sustainability. And coming back to the Walmart example, um, it was during uh, Hurricane Katrina that they came up with this idea of what can we do for social and environmental good and build it into our business model? And one of their strategies was the cut cost model, a strategy that reduces your operational cost to maximize your benefits. And how do they do this? Something as simple as looking at a vehicle fleet that does delivery all across the United States, 7,000 vehicles. 
they worked with vehicle companies to redesign vehicles, redesign engines, train drivers of these vehicles, change their behavior, change how they maneuver the vehicles when driving them. And this allowed them to save, as a business, about 140 billion US dollars. And environmentally, 87,000 tons of carbon dioxide was prevented from being emitted into the atmosphere. So it makes business sense, and it makes environmental sense. So this is the kind of awareness we need to create among private sector. It's not for government only. It's not for NGOs only and civil society organizations. That thinking, that mindset needs to shift. And therefore, we say it's this education that needs to be created out there. It's less the incentives and more the awareness of it can be done and it can make business sense. Fantastic. I just want to do a quick check because our time is up. Do we still do Q&A? Do we have some time? OK. OK, fantastic. I've never had anyone say, no, continue. Uh, <laughs> That is, that's great, because I want to pick up from where Kariska left on how do we recalibrate, how do we move forward, and bring it back to Herman, because what, what you've managed to do is say, we've set ourselves some targets for net neutrality, if, if, I, if, if I'm correct, and what you've done is you've exceeded your targets and you're now is effectively becoming net positive or a net contributor. Yeah, well that's, that's our aspiration. So, so we had uh, 2020 uh, sustainability goals, which we met mostly. Um, and um, you can go and read on our website, but um, we've got the aspirational uh, 2025 sustainability goals and, and we term it net positive. So really what we're saying is we don't want to do less harm as a corporate. We actually want to put that more into this, back into um, um, you know, do more good than we take out. So, um, a simple example, um, um, the majority of our raw materials is timber, and the majority of our products is timber pallets. So, we do take down a lot of trees, etc. That's all at this point in time, it's all that they see accredited forest, forest. so um, as, as far as this, we can see planted all the time, so it's a, re, you know, it's a, a resource that's, that's replanted. Um, but for our 2025 goals, we're saying for every one tree we take down, we want to plant two. So we want to actually reforest, and we want to do more good than, than uh, and, and, and we've got that in di different aspects. We've got it in as, as for planet, for business, and for for, cons uh, for communities. Uh, got it. Got it. Thank you. <coughs> Question to the two entrepreneurs on stage. Okay. We often find ourselves in forums like this, celebrating startups, and I find that there's this conflation between a digital or technology startup and businesses driving crucial outcomes. And I think we sometimes place an unfair emphasis on the role of technology. I'd love to get your thoughts on how we're leveraging technology in the right way, not because we're imposing the use of technology in solving our problems specifically when it comes to sustainability, and circular economies. Do you think that there's an educational piece? Do you think that there's a narrative piece that we need to work on as a community to decouple some of these uh, things that we seem to be conflating? Or do you think we're okay? Uh, all right, let, uh, let, let me start from here. Um, within the African ecosystem, African ecosystem um, there seems to be uh, some level of complexity, especially with the system. So, Direct solutions that immediately will work in um, maybe um, America or Europe most likely would not immediately work within the African ecosystem because of limited infrastructure, limited you know um, internet access, a couple of things, right? And that is where you know innovators in Africa need to effectively position ourselves in the sense that we are creating solutions to a great problem within where we are. And I tell people, um, yes, we, we are a tech enabled um, company. The first thing, primarily what we are, is a value chain startup. We are basically using tech to infuse and scale what we do. 
And uh, because uh, when, when we talk about tech company, if we don't put the African you know, mix into it, we only think that it's just creating the technology. Right. The technology is created most time in the African ecosystem to serve limited infrastructural problem. Yeah. Uh, right? And that must be the first thing. That is why the solution within the African ecosystem is taking the problem, which quote unquote might not be a problem within, you know, much more developed areas. For example, the problem of waste, the way we solve it, yeah. most of it is not a problem. For our same people, maybe when we're engaging with people, some maybe mentors or some organization outside of the African ecosystem, they don't understand why um, somebody will now say, This is what I'm doing for a business, as a business, right? But this is a real time problem mm -hmm. that needs to be solved, right? So, in, in, the, in, the, in the context of Africa, I like to say that we are solving a real problem, but with technology. Any, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, and hopefully I'm not criticizing my previous team, but I do want to give you some context in what I used to do. Uh, I was responsible for finding ways that frontier technology could apply to what UNICEF does globally. Uh, usually that came down to how does blockchain make supply chain better, or how does drones uh, make vaccine delivery faster, or how does AI make disease outbreak detection better. And all of these make great headlines, and we came up with really great solutions. But it always frustrated me that it usually serviced maybe 5% of any population that we were trying to solve. And I'll be very blunt, it actually, it doesn't, it actually deeply bothers me of the overemphasis of digital tech uh, as the tech that Africa's needing. Not because it doesn't merit it, I think it does have a place in it, but it doesn't solve a popular. It, it doesn't solve a problem for the majority of people. The reason why Google, a former employer of mine, is very successful is it's servicing the majority of the human population's needs, which is to organize information. If we're not able to start thinking, especially within the context of Africa, about problems that are very relevant to many and most and find solutions that can be applied to many and most, it's not really interesting, right? It really isn't. Yes, it could be tech, it could be really nice, it's really great for me to sit here and talk about FinTech and, and blockchain and all of these great buzzwords at times, but if those technologies are not solving a problem for most, it's actually very bothersome. And I think that's the one key takeaway that I've, that I've had in my experience today what makes technology tech is when it's actually solving a novel problem to novel solution. And hopefully that's uh, a great enough answer for you. Fantastic. I've got a bit of a nudge here. Do we, do we have time for a closing thought? I just want to leave the last word. I, I think if we do it at speed, you know, there was a time that I thought okay. I was in charge. Turns out I have powers that be. <laughs> yeah, there was a time that we have to wrap up this first conversation. <laughs> uh, I thought to myself, you, you've extended me an extra five minutes, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up. So can I just do closing thoughts? Where, where are the powers? No, that's fine. Let's do quick, closing, like, really quick. Just like the so, so I'm going to leave. Uh, you with the closing thought, and, and then going into that, it's this word collaboration that I think has naturally uh, filtered its way through through this conversation. Anyone familiar with the with the pale blue dot? Carl Sagan, yes. So so there's this there's this principle called the overview effect, and it's essentially it's it's it's, it's a cognitive effect that astronauts and cosmonauts have when they're outside, when they're in space, and they look at the Earth as a pale blue dot, and it impacts the way they view the universe. And that has been reportedly a very profound effect when they come back to Earth and the way they view us, us as being the same people on the same planet and being together. So we've heard about stakeholder collaboration, and we've also heard about cross-sector collaboration, FinTech and health, etc., when it comes to sustainability. How are you going forward working on that in using your position with the UNDP, whether it's through accelerators, et cetera, to continue to enhance this culture of collaboration? And we, we'll leave it there. 
Yeah, thanks. And I think very quickly, that is first and foremost the UN's and the UNDP's role. It's playing this convener in these types of discussions. And, you know, it, we could not say it more. Government, private sector, academia, um, NGOs, everyone needs to be sitting at the table when you're trying to make transformative, systemic impact. You could be a, a founder of a company with a great technology that can do good, that can make money, uh, but sometimes being the first mover of an innovation and startups in the room would know, comes with some of its drawbacks. You know, there's costs involved in be being a founder of a new technology, and then there's competitors that come on board and try and steal ideas and so on. And there's this first mover advantage, but there's also the first mover disadvantage. And to overcome that first mover disadvantage is to get your peers in the room, get your competitors in the room, and if you really want to make a difference, sharing this knowledge with them, becoming um, you know, individuals that all want to use solar energy for construction or in their businesses. Um, if we all do it together, we can really make transformative change. And therefore, coming back to your point, convening everybody in a room, policy makers and business and so on, it becomes it is the critical, it's a game changer, and it's needed to make real difference in the world. So as you go about, as a startup, trying to make impact, trying to grow, grow a business, keep this at the back of your mind. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, Caitlin, the powers that be. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Please give our panelists a round of applause.